Thanks to Scott Riker there for his fabulous theme music. We're not using it every podcast because some of them were really trying to sort of run out to you extremely fast, like post-game podcasts that run till like 1.30 in the morning and we're just trying to get it out there sometime before the next game begins. Uh, this is pre-game podcast number three for ALDS game. Wait a minute. It's pre-game podcast three for ALDS game four. It's very confusing. I'm not even sure why I'm trying to introduce it that way, but we are previewing ALDS game four, which is the second game in Chicago. Uh, another must game for the Chicago White Sox. Joining me to preview game four right out of the Indianapolis field office, our champ when it comes to recapping record. It's Chris O'Keefe. Thank you for jumping on. This is crucial. It is. It's scary. I mean, having you on coverage and on this podcast is crucial, but yes, game four is also scary and crucial. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Crystal, we had, uh, of course, I guess you call it a classic, classic-ish um, game three. I mean, classic in terms of White Sox winning, always a classic. We don't have that many postseason wins. Uh, so certainly coming off of uh, a little bit of buzz there. And wow, uh, White Sox run right into a weather wall. Uh, game is canceled for Monday. Uh, of course, the uh, we're just hours away, of course, from game four. They're rescheduled uh, here on Tuesday. Uh, do you think in any way, how, how does it affect uh, momentum in the series? Clearly, it must have swung for whatever mystical thing momentum is. Uh, it, it certainly swung to the White Sox, not only because they had the big win, but then the big eighth inning in terms of offensive output. Uh, do you think it further helps the White Sox in that the uh, Astros are a little more in their own heads, thinking it's maybe not going to be as easy as they thought it was? Or does it hurt the Sox because now they got to just sort of sit and stew for 24 hours? I think it helps the Sox more than anything because you're giving Carlos an extra day to yeah. rest, which I think is crucial where he's at because I was doing some research on him and I realized he hasn't like pitched a full season so of course he's sore. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good advantage. And I think he's going to be able to come out tomorrow a lot sharper. I don't know if the Astros are even affected by it. I don't really care <laughs> about. <laughs> that's a fair feeling. answer. <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think it's for the best. I yeah. think uh, everybody gets a day off. That was kind of unplanned. And like I said, Carlos can rest. Maybe Adam Engel can rest and he can get out there. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's something we sort of, uh, well, I won't say jokingly because I think we came back pretty hard at some of the Houston fans who were downplaying the, the significance of their opponent, given that they won two more games in the White Sox this year, uh, denigrating the AL Central, which no one's going to argue is great. We call the AL Central garbage all year, but the AL West isn't any um, um, a difficult, difficult <laughs> mission either. Um but I mean, given that attitude of, well, it's preordained that they're going to go to a, whatever it is, fifth straight ALCS and, and all that. And, you know, Dusty Baker came in, you know, they, they went far. Uh, everybody seems to forget. I think they were, for two months, they were below 500 last year. They made the playoffs. They had a great run in the playoffs, but, you know, all this um, hi hat talk about like, you know, we're, we're like the best team. We're a dynasty. <laughs> Simmer down. But, you know, you wonder if a little bit of that could creep onto Houston. Uh, I know the players are supposed to freeze all that out. Dusty Baker's a veteran manager who you think is probably going to be able to downplay that pretty well for players. But the truth is, uh, uh, at least everybody in Houston apparently just thinks it was going to be a fair cakewalk. It's certainly a win for Houston. So every inning that goes by where that's not in the bag, that can't feel good. Yeah, that's true. And I think they are probably humiliated from yesterday because they did think they were just going to come sweep yeah. and boy, was that rough on them. Um, yeah. So yeah, it could be in their heads that they're kind of freaking out now. And with Carlos pitching how he has this year, they they've got a good matchup tomorrow on their hands. So mm -hmm. they could be in trouble, especially if those bats are going to stay hot. All right, well, you've nibbled at it a couple times now, so let's get to the next phase of this podcast, and that is the pitching matchup. And um, I won't call it a panic move, but it's an interesting move that uh, Dusty Baker is calling on Lance McCullers uh, on regular rest, but Lance McCullers for a game four rather than a, a must game five back in Houston. Uh, I don't know that you blame him for it, 
but it is um it's an unforced move it isn't necessary and i sort of as a if i have to choose and it's it's definitely choosing between poisons i think i'm going to take facing him in chicago where weather could be a factor certainly a crowd is going to be a factor it's a very different atmosphere that he's going to have to face anything that throws this guy off uh, i think i'm in favor of i i sort of like him getting the ball in game four yeah also the Sox have seen him yeah he manhandled them the first time around but they've seen him they know what he's capable of they've got video from just that last game with him so I think it'll be easier this round and yeah he can't um do anything shady in Chicago (laughs) we'll get to that uh yeah and you know let's not forget I don't think anyone is assuming the White Sox are going to have um, 35 worm burning um, 50 exit velocity ground balls find their way into the outfield the way game three went. But at the same time, I think it's a lot to ask uh, or a lot to expect that somehow Houston's going to be able to have to magically uh, get to every ball the White Sox hit, which in games one and two, let's face it, the Sox didn't play well. They also got zero breaks, zero luck. Even if you split the difference there and they're catching some breaks, you got to, that has to add up to a better attack against McCullers. And they didn't get blown out in game one. So the margin isn't terrible. Uh, you know, his performance comes down a little bit from, as you say, the familiarity of seeing him just a, uh, a couple of games ago uh, on the road. You know, a lot of other different factors there. Okay, that maybe takes him down to 80% of what he was in, in game one. White Sox get a couple of the breaks, come the momentum, some of that blackout crowd, which every every player seems to acknowledge was a major, major factor for them. I think you're looking at, 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 at worse for the White Sox an even game at this point against their best pitcher. Yeah. I 100% agree with every single word you just said. Well, uh, let's then move on to what <laughs> you intimated uh, and Ryan to intimated. <laughs> uh last night uh we didn't acknowledge it on the post game podcast a because we were just trying to i think stay awake but second of all we hadn't really at that point known uh that uh ryan got a little brash there in um well i i would say it's more than intimating but uh basically saying hey there's still some funny stuff going we know this organization uh vaguely presuming i guess if not maybe actually knowing presuming untoward things are still going on in Houston, uh, connecting the fact that uh, there were uh, the, the, the swinging strikes in Chicago that aren't there in Houston. Uh, seems, seems like a stretch, but at the same time as everyone is now coming back out today, given all the extra time we've had today, the point out and saying, this team has earned zero benefit of the doubt. And if there's any smoke, you're going to assume there's a fire there. And uh, you know, for anyone who's crying foul on the Houston side, hey, sorry, you dug this hole, guys, and you're going to be in that hole for years, if not decades. Yeah, when you're not punished, even in the slightest, you're going to, you're going to be shit on until you can prove otherwise. Also, you know what? I have dated some cheaters in my <laughs> lifetime, and I had this advice given to me that once a cheater, always a cheater. So, sure. sorry, something fishy's going on there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you there. Okay, we are welcoming in also Zach Hayes to the podcast, who's going to uh, lend some expertise here as well. Uh, Zach, you've come in. If you can't already figure it out, we have reached the Ryan Tapera portion of the podcast, uh, addressing the fact that at this point, if there's even the smallest bit of smoke surrounding or emanating from Minute Maid Park or the train that's overheated or whatever, uh, you're going to have to assume maybe there's a little fire there. Uh, even though Ryan Tapera's comments would seem to be uh, quite a stretch, I'm sorry, Houston doesn't really have a benefit of the doubt. Yeah, until they acknowledge, if to like, you know, L2 and them acknowledged, I'm going to actually refer to it as Enron Field. Um, yeah, fair. <laughs> no, no more, no more Minute Maid. They've lost that privilege. That's Houston is scandals and cheating. And like, man, it's so nice. dumb. It's all so dumb. And it's like, Dusty, Dusty is grandstanding. He knows who Tapera is. Tapera probably doesn't actually think they're like doing the trash can thing again. It's, there's so much gamesmanship and 
grandstanding. And I think players really still are pissed off at the Astros and specifically the, you know, the ones who didn't really get much in the way of punishment. So like, yeah, kind of a whiny thing to say, like, I kind of wish we had not needed to have this conversation, but like, I see where to is coming from and it's like, yeah, no, there's like, you don't, <laughs> they, they just don't get to say anything. You, you cheated. <laughs> like it is yeah. what it is. Sorry. Like you don't get the benefit of the doubt. You could have not gotten caught cheating and then you yeah. wouldn't have to hear this, but yeah. they did. So <laughs> There's uh, nothing more consummately Texan for a baseball fan to always draw comparisons than to the 1919 White Sox, ignoring a really, really crucial element of the two different cases. And that doesn't just come down to punishment because punishment was significantly different. But yeah, sort of how they went about the cheating. I think there's a difference. Uh, I'm not sure that a person from Texas and I... Went to school there, but uh, <laughs> which, all right, I'm going to run myself down further. Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't it doesn't shock me, and yet time and time again they keep going to that, and I think you're missing a real key point to the uh, to the whole discussion. If they Astros would like fans. to talk like that, then perhaps they should just be banned for life. <laughs> I mean, that's open to them. If somebody wants to, be, if Altuve wants to say, hey, you know, I've really I've thought about it now over these past several years since all of this happened. And yes, I was wearing the strange EKG machine. And yes, you know, I really think I'm getting, I'm getting up there anyway. I think it's time for me just to retire and be banned from the sport. Yeah, then okay. Then, then we can make that direct comparison. No, no He'll problem. Have so much more time for all of his fake tattoos. <laughs> That's right. All the stories. Yeah. Boy, Tapera just scratched the surface, oh, really. Yeah. Uh, one thing we did uh, uh, address, Zach, uh, before you came on, but I would like to get your take on it. Uh, your thoughts on the fact that the White Sox uh, are sort of having to pause. I mean, we were thinking, you know, like three hours after the end of game three, they're going to be back out there swinging the hot bats in game four. Okay, now add 24 hours to that. Uh, in momentum, for whatever it means, uh, is this postponed game, is it? Uh, going to impact more Houston, who has to sit and stew maybe for another day, thinking they might have already had this thing wrapped up, uh, or does it hurt the Sox more because you know, particularly even with the eighth inning rally that they had, uh, you know, they're sort of having to cool their bats for 24 hours. Uh, I don't think it hurts. Probably not either team all that much. If anything, I'm I'm not one of those people that doesn't believe in momentum. I 1,000 percent believe in momentum. That being said, I think anything that the Sox might be losing by playing tomorrow instead of today is probably gained back by getting to see McCullers at home instead of in Houston, if they see him again. Um, Cause you know, you have, if you're moving on, you have to beat him at least once and I'll take that game at home 10 times out of 10. If anything, like, I don't know what the deal with player psychology here is or anything, but if anything, I would imagine it maybe gives Houston a little more like they're starting to feel the heat a little bit more because they don't want to have to go back and play a next like travel and then play a game tomorrow and then potentially have to go on and, it looks like it's going to be Boston as of right now. So um, I think it's like probably not a, much of a difference maker at all. Uh, but if it is, then I think the Sox are probably benefiting, benefiting from it. A tiny yeah. Bit, if anything. Yeah. yeah. If, if Houston's already feeling maybe a little bit of heat, given the fact that they had a, th a three, four run lead yesterday and, and blew that mm -hmm. and then got blown out or whatever that turned out to be that ridiculous game. I fell asleep several times. So I don't even know exactly how everything wrangled out, but I know the White Sox won because we are still doing a post game, pregame podcast. Uh, but you know, if that was already creeping in, um, boy, a loss in game four. Oh yeah. There's going to be some heat and you can talk psychology all you want, but they got to go back to Houston very quick turnaround with, I have to say, any way you sort of grab at it, certainly not a, a starting pitching advantage, and I would argue probably a disadvantage, is is not great for the Astros and 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 great for White Sox fans, right? So you know, let's just keep that momentum momentum going. Let's take a quick break. Uh, I'm not sure what else we're going to talk about. I, I, you know, we we may talk a little bit about fan gatekeeping. You know, it could come up. It's it's a it's a hot topic these days. We had a whole day off to to think about it, uh, or else we'll just talk. I'll just I'll field questions uh, from from my guest, or maybe we'll just listen to more of Scott Reichard's uh, take on "Don't Stop Believing." I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but uh, stick around because in a minute you'll find out. Hey, White Sox fans, it is, I'm going to get this right this time. It's pregame podcast number three for ALDS game four. There's your, your, there's your Sudoku puzzle for the day. <laughs> uh, I am joined by Crystal O'Keefe representing the Indianapolis field office and kicking ass on coverage all year long. 
and hopping on. Oh, and plenty of time to still get full credit for this podcast. It's Zach Hayes, uh, who uh, took in game three. And I guess, why don't we start part this grab ass section two of the podcast? What was the experience like? Uh, I understand there was maybe some rough experiences folks had, but uh, how'd you like the blackout? Uh, I assume maybe you weren't there for 2008. So uh, how'd all that go? Oh man. Uh, I like, it's great because it's actually, it was really the perfect medium because I remember pretty much everything, every facet of the game, every out made. And then I went back and looked at like the text conversations I was having with people at the game. And I don't remember anything after the Larry Garcia home run, uh, which, which, <laughs> Was I was I was at the uh, Burley's perfect game and got to see, of course, you know, the Dwayne Wise catch and all that stuff, which I just don't think unless I should be so lucky to see a World Series clincher is ever really going to get topped in terms of like historical rarity of like, am I ever going to see this again? That being said, like that home run was one of the most electric fandom experiences I've ever had. It made it really did make the whole thing worth it. That's what we've been we've been chasing for a long time. And it was uh, it was it was it was fulfilling. That's all I can say. Zach, the, the thing I remember and the reason why the 2008 game stood out to me, maybe um, distinctively from the entire playoff run, I was lucky enough to be there for all the home playoff wins in 2005, no World Series clincher, but a lot of wins. Um, and why in a way it was better is because you really felt, I mean, in addition, just the, the strangest atmosphere you've never seen before. I mean, everybody really was all in with the blacked out, uh, the, the tension of a game 163, whatever was that you felt really like you were having an impact on the game. And, 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 and last night uh, and today, the White Sox players sort of acknowledged that. Did you sort of feel almost like a sixth man uh, there in a way that you might not, even for a, a, a very heavily attended a normal White Sox game? Yeah, I, I don't know how much of like a participatory feeling I got out of it necessarily. I felt that like the, the energy was good and that the players were feeding off the energy and we were – obviously contributing to that it's man maybe I, maybe i should start giving myself a little bit of credit i don't know you should <laughs> i i took a little stake in that but no it was that is a pretty unique experience at this point we just have not had you know unless you're lucky enough to get some you know bulls or blackhawks tickets on one of their playoff runs that whole feeling that reciprocal feeling between the team and the crowd is not something that i've, I've had to experience much of in my life so it was quite it was it was a joy to be able to to be a part of that yeah hey, zach i want you to know on my scorecard i am now amending the box score i am giving zach hayes a hold for last night's game so there we go you are in there and claim your participation uh in it um well, hey, I don't know what else we're missing in this pregame podcast. Uh, some other strange things going on around the game. Uh, it seems to me like we've unfortunately caught a little bit of strange Cubs fandom in some of the behavior uh, after being off for 13 years and not having a playoff game, which is unfortunate. Uh, but also, uh, we've had a big gatekeeping controversy about uh, what qualifies as a fan and without really dignifying too much of it. I mean, our, our stance... Here is, we want all of the fans we can, right? Everyone is welcome to enjoy the White Sox romping through the American League for the next decade or so, or maybe the window just will never close, putting a jam in the window so it never closes. Uh, it's really not about checking resumes, right? They let people in not wearing black last night. So, I mean, if you're going to do that, I don't think you can really check resumes. No, I agree. And I said this in our like group Slack. My aunt, always Cubs fan, she was the one that raised me on baseball in the first place, but she would go to Cubs games. She'd go to White Sox games. She said, you root for the city. If one team is doing well, by all means, cheer for that team. And, you know, I'm not going to cheer for the Cubs, but I don't care if a Cubs fan is coming. You're filling the seat. You're buying a beer. You're cheering for the team. You're cheering for the city. Who gives a shit where you just came from? Like, who fucking? Cares? Sorry, I should not say the f word. Who cares? Like, hey, this is charged up. Yourself. I'm here for the explicit content warning always. But I just I don't understand this mentality of like. You aren't allowed to be here because you have been seen at Wrigley. Like, piss off. Grow up. This is 
for everyone. If you want to grow the sport, don't gatekeep the sport. It is not just for you. Anyone can be a fan, especially if a team is in the playoffs. Wait, you want get them. over it. <laughs> it. And this one is so mind-bogglingly dumb to me too, because it's one thing <laughs> if you want to be like, um, like I'm I'm a third generation Southsider on both sides of my family. I'm never gonna root for the Cubs in my life. You can't make me. I rooted for St. Louis. I rooted for the Mets in 2016. I rooted for who? I don't even remember who they played. I rooted for. I sure as sure as shit rooted for Cleveland in 2016. Uh, that being said, like this is the opposite thing. Like if no one can make me root for the Cubs but if I had wanted to root for the Cubs like why would you say no like just what <laughs> it's it it just doesn't make make any sense to me and there's just I don't know <sighs> with with the heightened profile of, of a playoff appearance comes a lot of people trying to get clicks and for in any number of different ways you could take that word uh yeah. And it seems like a lot of these really, if these things are too idiotic to be true, it because it might be because to some extent they, they kind of are there. The idiocy is almost, is almost the point. And that's such an idiotic take on fandom that I can't really see it as anything, but any, somebody trying to stir the pot in just the most jerky way possible. <laughs> also uh, imagine like getting bodied by someone and still uploading that video. Imagine Uh, getting bodied by someone who is in 16 candles, man. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Like, come on. Wow. And you post that and you're like, oh, look what I did just for clout. Like, come on, dude. The pro tip tip here is if you are going to accost a fellow fan, famous or otherwise, Mm -hmm. uh, with some sort of credentialing or resume checking, you'd better at least be able to um, demonstrate a basic knowledge of the team you claim to be part of the tribe of. Um, I mean, John Cusack was not uh, throwing trick questions out there. Uh, I'm guessing wasn't even throwing a question out about a year that that fan had not even been born. I mean, this is some, the White Sox haven't been in the playoffs so much. It's like two, it's not the Yankees where it's like, oh man, I really totally forgot that guy ever played for the Yankees during their 85th world series title. This stuff should really stick out. So if you're getting shut down by the so-called non-fan, you're not even knowledgeable enough to know some really basic information about this team you are proclaiming to represent, which we know it doesn't have to do anything with this at all. And just imagine with, if anyone who doesn't look like that guy decided to make that sort of imposition on another fan, imagine how that would have gone. Uh, I'm guessing we'd be watching video and it would have a very different ending. And uh, I'm sure we would all be cringing and uh, I don't know, starting collections up for that person. So, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I hope there's a lesson learned. We know there is not a lesson learned, but the one thing we can do, I think is uh, shed some attention and throw support against this type of behavior, even though we know it is spinning in the wind to a degree, because the more it's exposed, maybe the more, listen, we've held the White Sox feet to the fire before, and Rick Hahn was calling out the fan base uh, unprovoked for some reason. There was a lot of pushback, including from Southside Sox. I like to think that has a little bit to do with how he's changed his approach from here, although he still sometimes makes those missteps. The fact that these guys are playing with that organization and that figure uh, as if that's their strongest alliance out there in the White Sox coverage arena is something they really ought to think harder about because it is not sending any sort of positive message to the healthier and the area of the fan base where there's a lot more growth. I think <laughs> I think that organization is tapped out. I'm just not sure how many drunken frat guys who look a certain way are still left to be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a White Sox fan. I think they're there. So White Sox, it's, you know, you don't have to listen to any of us, but, you know, I think you already know this. I think uh, you need to bet on some different horses because uh, this is not the way to go. And it's not a good look 
when just a few weeks ago, you're cozying up for like an hour with that organization. It's, it's not a good thing. And I don't think it leaves any of us walking away feeling too good about the team in the middle of a playoff run. It's not going to, it's not that big a deal, but if this was a regular season game, if this is any other different circumstance, it would leave an even worse taste in the mouth, I think. Also two things to this first can we normalize being a casual fan that doesn't have to sit through the bad years and just wants to attend a playoff game in peace? Like that's a big thing. But also this whole incident reminded me of all of the times that men come up to me because I'm wearing a bear shirt, a white sock shirt. And they're like, Oh, what do you even know? Are you into this because of your boyfriend? Like, what do you know about baseball? And I just want to be like, bitch, I get paid to write about it. So I know a little bit, but it's that whole, like, well, what is their assistant coach's blood type? What is the maiden name of the quarterback's mom? Like, we don't have to answer these questions. I am not a dancing monkey for you. You can get over yourself. Like, get out of the habit of trying to just have to prove your fandom to people let people be a casual fan let people enjoy a game in peace just no one has to prove anything to you hey, and you're i don't gonna, understand why that was a thing you're gonna need to be watching the podcast for this one but uh okay um cheryl uh who was nirvana <laughs> drummer before dave Grohl? <laughs> see but that's the thing like yeah. that's what people get asked yeah you in particular you Fans like you get asked more often than I would. If I'm wearing that shirt, I'm guessing no one's going to need me to uh, to repeat Nirvana's top 40 hits to prove that I can wear the shirt. And yeah, and I get that's it. that's I a get bullshit it. scene for sure. I get it constantly. I mean, sports bands, anything. But there are so many times where there are guys that will come up to me and be like, "What do you even know about baseball?" And I'm like, "Honey, I know more than you." <laughs> So <laughs> it'd be best to stop now. We could still talk. It might be best to just wrap this up now. You might get a different response from someone else. The next mark you try to hit, not me. Might be best just to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Zach, I take it you are not going to be able to attend uh, game four. Or are you on uh, on for game four as well? Oh, no, I splurged. I, I, I saw the other day on um, on Saturday, you know, after they lost, I, I was looking at stuff up and the prices were down a little bit and I saw some a, a good spot right up in the 500s behind home plate. And I was like, um, oh, fuck it. All right. You know? <laughs> we'll do it. So, yeah, no, I will be there. I will. I will be in attendance tomorrow. It seems like the trend is to get a churro. Hmm. But Keelan. multiple, you can't just yes. take one. Right. Okay. Keelan had to go like double, triple, I don't know, like 10. I don't know, but. What, what I always got to Venmo what, her. What are her favorite churro flavors? What flavor? Oh, see, I didn't catch that. I just saw the mm. churro and her being very angry at it because I think when she bought the first one, they slumped. And then well, the thinking, second, mm. they turned it around. So. Got to get the specifics of it. You know, you can't just be a little stitious. You have to. Be All right. Away. All right. That's true. All right. Well, that's going to have to be a sideline discussion, I suppose. Now, here's some good news, Southside Sox listeners, readers, viewers. Uh, well, first of all, White Sox are still playing the playoffs. The White Sox are looking good to send it back to Houston to maybe take this series in, probably. Uh, but maybe the best news of all for game four, and we did not plan it this way. This has been set for like weeks or days. Recap, Super Joseph Rhesus. Six-pack, Crystal O'Keefe. Uh, that weird, like, notebook, Twitter, social thing, post-game quotes thing, Colleen Sullivan. Those just happen to be the top three records when it comes to coverage this season. So inadvertently, we went to our big guns. We've got three closers in the game covering game four if that doesn't make you feel good about how the how this game is going to turn out and we got a guy there we got zachary hayes there forget about it uh and he's apparently going to be getting some churros i don't i don't know he's oh. going to figure out what flavor uh because he splurged so we are not messing around when it comes to our coverage i don't know what we're going to do for game five i mean we might have to like you know shuffle some stuff crystal may just never get to not work again but <laughs> uh, listen, you just got to take the hit if it comes down to it, okay? I'm on tweets that night. Yeah, yeah so there. Hey. We got her yeah. on for game five already. 
And you know what? If you're willing to use bring in the big guns and use your closers down to one, that already makes you a more modern manager than Tony Larusa. So, can I be DM, please? <laughs> you're gonna I'm have on to. This podcast. You're the one. You get to stake claim to it. <laughs> you got to work on the Aussie accent for the next podcast, or maybe post game or whatever. But you know, uh, uh, work on that. And uh, yes, Liam. Okay, you you are assigned, Liam. We'll give Joe, you know, who are Joe, Mikey, Kimbrell, Kim, Kimbrell. Sorry, Joe. Sorry. That's what you get for not being here. Yeah, no kidding. You guys show up. All right. Well, I guess that wraps it up for our really surprise pregame podcast. There wasn't supposed to be one, but hey, we got an extra day to do it. So we're doing one. Uh, we will have a post game to celebrate the game for victory. Zach Hayes will not be part of that unless he's calling in, just yelling from the L, which he might. It could happen. We have yet to have real drop-ins, but it could happen. Uh, but we will be around to uh, celebrate the victory, or if something else happens, like it ends tied or something, we'll we'll be around to discuss a post game and, and look forward to a game five because it's it's back to back real quick. We're cramming in the last two games of this series. So uh, thank you for hanging out there with us. We almost pushed a thousand comments on the game thread for game three. And I got to guess maybe we're going to break it for game four. So I've never seen that before. Uh, so thanks for your participation and readership and listening to these podcasts. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Uh, thank you, Zach Hayes. Uh, go and bring us home another victory tomorrow, please. And with Crystal Creek O'Keefe on coverage, I mean, it ain't a guarantee, but it's about as close as you're going to get this season on Southside Sox. So thank you, Crystal, for even gracing us on this pregame podcast. Appreciate it. we are just uh, like minutes at this point when you're listening probably minutes away from game four enjoy the game uh uh, zach you better jump on the L real quick because i think you're late uh get on it and uh we will catch all of you uh at the uh at the conclusion of game four we'll be talking in the post game podcast thanks everybody for listening